banking philosophy? Yeah. All right, so some of the differences between uh, the, the, the philosophy towards banks between uh, Jefferson and, uh, and Hamilton. Is it? I wonder if it's... Um, so first, let me say I'm no expert on either Jefferson or Hamilton, and there are people out there who are real experts on this and who've read all the stuff and, and so on. Um, so, uh, so that as a caveat, uh, let me say that I, I think my sense is that both Jefferson and Hamilton were wrong on banking. Uh, they both got it wrong. Je Jefferson was very suspicious of financial interests. He was very suspicious of banks. He, he, was, he was very worried about financial concentration of power, of economic power. He didn't like the idea of any kind of big bank. And, and really, Jefferson is the one who ultimately dominated the discussion on banking and, and had a, a really massive influence on the history of banking in the United States. Because what happened was, because of Jefferson's suspicion of, um, of large banks, and because of the fact that he very much, he was generally suspicious of industry and, and you could, you know, of, of, of capitalism as an econo as a, quite economics of industrialization and so on. Again, this is pre-industrial revolution. So it's, it's, it, it, it was, he didn't see what was coming clearly. Um, he was much more interested in farming in agrarian interest. He had this romantic view of the, the farmer, politician, soldier kind of thing uh, that, that, uh, maybe got from, from the Romans or whatever, but it, but it's very much the, 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 you know, the, the earth farming, working with your hands was very valued. So as a consequence, what happened was banks in the United States never got uh, chartered federally and, and never really became, never really were allowed to have a federal footprint that has never had the ability to actually have branches across the entire United States. What happened was that banks were, were, were chartered and regulated and controlled at the state level. And the states, having been significantly influenced by Jefferson, um, protected their banks and did not allow out-of-state banks to come into their, into their states to buy existing banks. They would not allow out-of-state banks to branch into their state. So what you got in the United States, unique to all of the countries in the world, is you got a banking system where every state had many, many banks. Some states did not allow banks to have more than one branch. Some states didn't allow the banks to go out of their county. But no states allowed banks to go outside or, or out, out of state banks to come into the states. It became a very, very controlled, regulated, and small industry with the exception of New York, which was the money center, money center banks they were called, but they even couldn't own banks outside of New York. So they had contractual relationships where they, where they provided help to those banks, provided loans to those banks, but they never or, or held deposits for those banks. But every bank was in a state and that was it. So that at its peak, the United States had over 20,000 banks. Now, just to give you a comparison, Canada generally has had five, five banks. United States is at 20, 000, over 20,000. Today, now in 1994, and I'll get to Hamilton in a minute. In 1994, Congress changed that and basically said banks could be federal in the sense that they, they got away from federalism, but in a good way, I think, in this case. I wish they'd do this with health insurance. They got away, with, uh, away from um, federalism. They basically said, Banks can go anywhere in the United States. They can branch anywhere. They can buy anyone. Uh, no, you cannot erect uh, barriers between states for banking activity. I mean, I, I think ultimately, ultimately that's the right. That was the right case, and and uh, and, and it should have been. It, it should have been under the uh, what do you call it? The interstate um, commerce. commerce, the commerce clause. But but it, it was never perceived that way in the Supreme Court ruled several times that banking did not count under the Commerce Clause. So, um, so 1994, Congress allowed this, and you got massive consolidation post-94. And as a consequence of that, um, today there are only 5,600 banks in the United States, down from 20,000. And we're probably heading towards 500 banks or 1,000 banks, but, uh, 
you know, not much more than that. Again, Canada has five banks. And just to give you one other data point, um, Canada, the United States, since its founding, has had 12 banking crises, 12. Financial crises centered around banks. Canada, during the same period of time, plus or minus, has had exactly zero, not a single banking crisis. And I would argue, and many other economists would argue, that many of the banking crises in American history are a consequence of the lack of diversification at the bank level and a consequence of this massively fragmented banking system all brought about by oh, too much respect, I think, for Jefferson's position. Hamilton, on the other hand, had a much healthier respect for industrialization a healthy respect for capitalism and, and, and you know, uh, and, and, a, and a, he understood the importance and the crucial function of banks. And it, I think if Hamilton would have won, you would have never got these kind of fragmented banking system. He was for federal charters of banks. So he had a much healthier, much more rational, much more educated position about finance and about banking than Thomas Jefferson did. However, he also believed that the United States should have, in a sense, a central bank or the equivalent of a central bank so that the United States government would have a, whether it was private or whether it was run by the government, a favored bank, a bank that it dealt with exclusively. And indeed, uh, you know, the first, I think the first American bank, and Bank of America, no, it wasn't Bank of America, the first something bank, national bank, uh, was, was created uh, when... Um, when Hamilton was Treasury Secretary. And, uh, you know, and it was later done away with in 1936 by uh, President, oh my God, I'm forgetting who was president. Who was the first populist president? Um, in 36, you said? Yeah, 1836. Oh, 1836. Yeah, 1836. Anyway, it doesn't really matter. Um, So, you know, they are, um, they were both flawed. And, and I think Hamilton, by advocating for a central bank, I think undercut his position and ultimately let Jefferson win. I think the proper solution would have been to have federally chartered banks, independent banks, private banks, no relationship with the state. Um, the state would bank with a variety of different banks. And, uh, you know, you put the treasury deposits and things like that. It would have to be a variety. It, it could not play favoritism. There would be no national bank, i.e. central bank or anything close to a central bank. Certainly there would be no Federal Reserve. And so I think, I think that Hamilton was right on the debate, but still fought. Andrew Jackson was the president. 1836, I think it was, where he did away with the first national bank of the United States. Um, and then there was a second national bank of the United States, and then we got the Federal Reserve. And there were periods in which there were no national banks in the United States. Uh, and it's called the free banking era. But the free banking era was flawed because you got, I mean, it was flawed for a number of reasons. But one of the reasons was you got this proliferation of small little banks that could not consolidate and could not have a national footprint. So banking in the United States, financial institutions of the United States, have been messed up, screwed up, badly regulated, not that there's a right way to regulate, but have been regulated by the state um, since the founding. And really, a lot of the economic problems, a lot of the economic problems that inflicted the United States during the 19th century and certainly during the early 20th century and uh, into all the way up to the, the Great Recession of 2008 were consequences of these kind of banking issues, the bad banking regulations, over-regulations, and the over-fragmentation of the industry. All right? Thank you. It's the best I can do in Hamilton and Jefferson. Right. What we need today, what I call the new intellectual, would be any man or woman who is willing to think. Meaning, any man or woman who knows that man's life must be guided by reason, by the intellect not by feelings, wishes, whims, or mystic revelations. Any man or woman who values his life and who does not give, want to give in to today's cult of despair 
cynicism and impotence, and does not intend to give up the world to the dark ages and to the role of the collectivist brutes.